Greasy with the University of Georgia. Mark is, uh, he coordinates the animal waste management program down there in Georgia, and he's also part of the leadership team for the Livestock and Poultry Environmental Learning Center. And we're really pleased to have Mark here to, to talk about the, the benefits of manure application. He has done quite a bit of work in this area. And with that, Mark, I would say go ahead and, and take it away. Thank you, Jill. Uh, can everybody hear me OK? I'll assume that's a yes. Uh, th this afternoon, I'd like to share with you all some information on land application of manure for beneficial reuse. We think this is uh, an important topic and added it to the webcast series for, for several reasons. Historically, animal manure was used as a fertilizer and a soil amendment. And prior to World War II, uh, it was a very important part of agriculture. With the advent of fertilizer and concentrations in animal production, uh, over the last few uh, decades, we've seen, seen in, in some circles, manure use has, has changed somewhat and is, is now considered a waste and a liability to some. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is to highlight the, the benefits that, that land application of manure offer they really go beyond the traditional nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium benefits uh, that, that most people are well aware of. Why is this important, and, and, and why do we need to be aware of these, these other, other benefits? Well, first off, it's because land application is the pre preferred use for manure. If you read all of the USDA and EPA guidance documents, uh, it led to the for formation of the combined animal feeding operation rules. Uh, basically, everyone's in agreement that, that perhaps the best use of manure is land, land applying that manure. We also need farmers to be aware of it so they can account for it. They need to know what manure is worth. And, and commonly, we're just looking at nitrogen uh, or, or maybe nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium content to determine the value of manure. And in reality, it may be more valuable than that. We also need to know the impacts of, of manure on water uh, when, we're, when EPA is doing TMDLs or, or we're looking, trying to assess the, the impacts animal feeding operations might have on, on watersheds. And finally, we need uh, regulatory agencies uh, to be, be aware of the benefits as well as we need uh, row crop producers or the, the, the potential users of manure to recognize the, the economic impacts and, and economic value of that manure. In my presentation today, uh, I'm not, not really an expert in this area, but I coordinated a, a team in uh, about 2002 that wrote a white paper for the National Animal and Poultry Waste Management Center. Uh, and then we, we updated this in 2005. And this was primarily a, a literature review type paper on the benefits of manure. It covered the benefits, which I'm going to concentrate on today. We also, in that paper, did a, a literature review on the limitations and what some of those are. And, and I'm only going to briefly mention those today. And it ended up with a, a section on research and extension needs in this area. Uh, throughout the presentation today, I'm not going to give a lot of the citations simply because there's too many and you can't fit them all on a slide. Uh, this paper is linked to the webcast flyer and on our webpage if people want to go look for more details and maybe uh, some of the specific references. So basically, what we started with in that paper is what we know. We know that, that, that manure can improve soil quality. We know it can increase the organic carbon content. Uh, we know it impacts the physical properties of that soil. We have documentation on what it can do to crop yields. Uh, and we know uh, quite a bit about how, how it can improve on farm economies. We also know that a lot of public concern and, and air and water quali quality problems are associated with, with using animal manures. What we don't know quite as much about, uh, in summary, are the impacts manure has on soil properties under uh, specific conditions. Only recently are people beginning to look at things like uh, sequestering, sequestering carbon with soil 
and trying to uh, assess the impacts on soil biology. We also, in, in looking at the literature, don't know a lot about the differences between manure types, the influences of application rates and application methods. And I'm going to highlight a couple examples of, of, of where we really uh, haven't got good documentation of some of these differences. So first off, with manure as a fertilizer and the nutrient content, uh, there's quite a bit of information out there in the literature on the manure nutrient content and the impacts that uh, collection and treatment method have on it, that animal species have, and, and to some extent on how application methods in, influence the uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium con content. Uh, we have standards out there. And, and in general, we'd say this, when it comes to, to nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, this is something we know a whole lot about of, and it's easy to find uh, detailed data on this. Uh, some examples and, and where we start getting a little bit off is when, when we look at the availability of, of these nutrients. Uh, Nitrogen has been studied for years, and you're, you're going to see in future presentations on today's webcast that we're still, still looking at uh, nitrogen and how it changes forms after it's land applied, and what is the availability of the nitrogen that we have in, in manure. We, uh, we, we see in literature availability for nitrogen rates that range from 0.1 up to 0.2. 0.95. In other words, studies have shown almost uh, a complete range of availability and how much of the nitrogen that's in manure is going to be available to crops. And we know a lot about what, what influences how much of it does become mineralized and available. There's also some, com some conflicting data on phosphorus availability, although uh, in general we know it's much more available than nitrogen. Uh, but still, we see uh, ranges from, from 60 to 100 uh, percent being used across the United States. Uh, likewise, for, for the most part, most of the potassium in manure is relative, re relatively available, and the literature says basically uh, 90 to 100 percent of it will be available. Micronutrients, we know a lot less. You can find, find studies and uh, on databases that give you the nutrient, the micronutrient contents of of some animal manures, uh, but routinely these are not accounted for, and we know that they can have a tremendous impact on productivity. The reason micronutrients often get overlooked and, and nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium probably do not is because so much of it depends on on how many what's available in your soil already. Uh, most soils do have sufficient micronutrient quantities, so, so people generally aren't fertilizing to meet these needs unless they're growing a, a specific crop that may be a heavy user. And so it's a, a little more difficult to find information on the micronutrients, but we know that that, that is an important benefit that manure has that, that maybe some inorganic fertilizers do not. Crop response to nutrients. This is uh, one of the most interesting areas uh, in the literature because uh, there are a lot of studies that have done paired comparisons between inorganic sources of nutrients and animal manures where they are trying to put on the exact same amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and, and they indicate uh, improved response to, to the manure nutrients. Now, oftentimes these studies do not actually indicate what it was that, that uh, was the reason for that improved crop response. Many times they speculate on changes in the physical properties in the soil, changes to soil uh, biology, but for the most part, uh, a lot of them don't prove, prove one, one or another of these uh, potential impacts or what resulted in improved crop yields. There is some data out there that uh, indicates some food quality uh, improvements, and, and really when, when you define food quality, it's somewhat subjective. 
but but there are studies that say that that uh, crops grown with uh, manures as fertilizer may have higher micronutrient contents or or other uh, food quality benefits. Most of this, uh, once again, is attributed to uh, improvements in soil quality. When we look at some crop, crop response, and, and, and the charts on this table were a study conducted down in Tifton that was, I, I think, a three or four year study on, on a crop rotation. We can see that uh, using manure, in, in this case we're using poultry litter, on cotton, millet, wheat, canola, and peanuts. And in most crops, you can see with increases in, in the application rates, you get improvements in yield up to a point, and then over application can, can lead to actual decreases in yields. I would point out here, uh, one of the crops at the top, the black line represents peanuts, which is a legume, and, and, and we, we know that uh, poultry litter on peanuts can lead to problems with accumulations of, of zinc uh, in the soil, and, and that may have a negative impact on peanut yields. And so basically, poultry litter on peanuts is not a, a, a recommended practice, at least in Georgia. Uh, so not all crops respond the same way. But uh, you know, data such as this is important to have for all crops. And, and, and probably changes from location to location around the country. What are some other benefits uh, that manure may, be, may offer? Soil pH is an important one, and, and numerous studies have indicated the ability of manure to neutralize soil acidity, uh, especially when it comes to poultry litter. Uh, we have, there are studies that have documented that the continuous application of poultry litter will not, not lead to uh, uh, decreases in soil pH. And really, uh, you can get an economic benefit from not having to, to lime your soils when you're using poultry litter as, as a fertilizer. Uh, there's a lot less known about uh, the impacts of uh, other animal manures or, or uh, dairy and swine waste, for example have a lot less impact on soil pH, but poultry litter, uh, probably because of the high calcium content, uh, is one that's been documented to have that benefit. benefit. Soil organic matters, there's over, over 20 studies citing organic matter increases. Uh, manure has a lot of carbon in it, so if we add it to the soil, we should see increases in the, the, the soil uh, carbon content, and, and the studies are pretty uh, pretty uniformly stating that, that, that we will increase soil organic matter over time using manures, and, and many of them say it's uh, suggest that it may be more effective than, than simply plant using uh, plant residues. Data also support increases in water stable aggregates, increases in infiltration, reductions in erosion, uh, reductions in soil compaction and some have even documented decreased energy requirements for tillage when using uh, animal manures. Continuing with the benefits, uh, so several studies have looked at cation exchange capacity, or CEC, and we know that we can uh, increase the buffering capacities of soil using uh, animal manures. We can improve water holding capabilities of soils. Uh, there, there's studies out of Colorado which suggest that uh, you can reduce your irrigation needs by using uh, animal manures and building the water holding capabilities of the soil. Uh, there's not a lot of data on pesticide or, or herbicide degradation, but some studies have suggested that uh, Probably, although the mechanism isn't confirmed, probably due to increases in soil biological activity, you may get, you get more rapid uh, degradation of, of pesticides when soils are uh, fertilized using manures. A lot of these changes, like I've already said a few times, are, are linked, to, loosely linked to soil biology changes. Uh, oftentimes, it's suggested that the increases in organic matter lead to more, more biological activity and a healthier soil. 
some studies have actually shown decreases in, in plant disease, uh, decreases in, in uh, nematode populations in the soil, or, or the, the negative the, the nematodes that influence uh, productivity. Uh, and, and a lot of these studies haven't been confirmed because of, because they're so difficult to do. What about manure type? Well, in this paper, we, we looked only at manure and actually tried to eliminate uh, studies that, that were focused on compost unless they compared a raw manure and a composted uh, product. So in general, uh, you know, the conclusions we drew in this paper were limited to manure. But even then, uh, it, it, it's difficult in the literature to distinguish between different types of manure. Uh, you can say generally that irrigated manure, manure in the liquid form, had a lot less documented uh, benefits. But it, it was somewhat surprising, at least to me, that how few side-by-side -side comparisons have been done where, where people have used a poultry litter, uh, dairy manure, or swine manure in a side-by-side -side comparison to see if there was differences in, in the types of manure and their impacts. Uh, so that they could be compared to each other. You know, we've got a lot of studies that were done on each of those things individually, but it's difficult to, to say, well, there are definite differences between poultry litter and dairy manure if you're not doing a side-by-side -side comparison. Let's move on and, and cover the impacts on runoff and soil erosion. There's been quite a few lab studies that have done it, and oftentimes these have reported conflicting results. If you look at uh, manure that's in a liquid form, it's being land applied. Some studies have said uh, lead head surface sealing occur on the soils and actually found increases in runoff uh, of, of about uh, six rainfall simulator studies have, have said that there's less runoff in it or, or soil erosion when when manure is used while uh, three have shown no impact or more runoff and soil erosion for a variety of crop and manure types. Most of the studies that you find out there just report nutrient concentrations and, and it's often difficult to find good data that, that are, are looking at the amounts of runoff or the amounts of soil erosion in these lab studies because nutrients been such a driving force and that's what, what most people report. When we look at uh, plot data, there's a lot fewer studies. Uh, many of these, once again, do not report uh, runoff or erosion differences. Of the, the four studies we found, all of them reported equal or, or less runoff and, and equal or less soil erosion in response to manure or litter applications. The best set of data out there that we found was the universal soil loss equation data. Uh, way back in the dust, dust Bowl years when, when the Soil Conservation Service was initially started, uh, one of their first efforts was documenting soil erosion and looking for BMPs. And they established over 30 stations around the country and uh, hundreds and hundreds of plots where they investigated uh, soil erosion and runoff uh, under plot conditions. Over 100 plot years of data from 1930 to 1974 were plot found where they were using manure additions as a soil erosion control BMP. Slopes on these varied from 4 to 16 percent, a variety of soils, uh, some of them were in fallow condition and, and, and many different crops. Uh, and this data set, I think, is probably the most complete data set for looking at the impacts of manure on runoff and soil erosion. And what was very surprising to me was when we looked at this data, in every case where they put manure out there on the soils, they had less runoff and less soil loss. Uh, soil loss was 13 to 77 percent less. Uh, runoff was 1 to 68 percent less. Uh, there was de a definite impact uh, with incorporation. Incorporation of the manure seemed to, to reduce runoff and soil loss more than just uh, applying it to the surface. 
And when we analyzed that data statistically, the manure application rate explained the most variability. The more manure you applied, the, the greater your reductions in runoff and soil loss uh, were. Now, why is it why is runoff and soil erosion important, and, uh, and and why do we need a better understanding of this data? Well, a lot of the infiltration and erosion models we have out there don't account for manure di additions outside of simply uh, making more nutrients available for runoff uh, and, and losses to the in the watershed. Uh, there are some models, USLE K values and some other erodibility measures, there have been modification techniques developed to account for soil organic matter changes, and these could be indirectly used to account for manure additions, but, but there aren't a lot of models out there being used that, that act, actually uh, do these modifications. Uh, if, if we don't modify to account for the, the models to account for these reductions in, in runoff and soil loss, then, then the models that we're making decisions on could be uh, erroneously over-predicting the amount of nutrients or, or soil that's being lost in these watersheds. Changing gears again real quickly, manure is a potential carbon sink. Uh, we know that carbon sequestration increases with manure application rate. Decreases with temperature, and, and one of the difficult th things to get out of the data is, is this impact because studies that are in northern climates uh, may, may show much greater uh, potential for carbon sequestration than studies in the southeast, for example. And we also know that, that, that moisture content influences your, the ability of your soil to sequester carbon long term. Uh, when, we're, when we're looking at potential uh, carbon offsets or, or global warming implications, methane and not, not nitrous oxide emissions are perhaps more important than carbon di dioxide, and we know that methane emissions can be reduced substantially in aerobic conditions as opposed to anaerobic conditions. And, and this l leads to a conclusion that that land application of these manures uh, is probably preferred a uh, preferred method in, in terms of reducing uh, methane emissions than perhaps lagoons long-term lagoon storage. Uh, and finally, uh, studies that have looked at composted manure have indicated that the composting process itself leads to a greater potential to sequester more carbon. Now, there, there, there's some debate about whether or not uh, you're actually losing more carbon in the, in the composting process and the net impacts. Uh, when I say here that you have the potential to compact or sequester more carbon with compost, it's primarily looking at, at direct land application and not necessarily the whole process. I, I'm not going to give a detailed overview of the limitations of, of manure, but I thought it would be uh, incomplete to not at least mention them. There are limitations to using manure that, that increase its use. A lot of these that are highlighted in our paper were the variability and uh, uh, inability to, to have a, a known manure nutrient content. Uh, Transportation and handling costs are usually much greater than inorganic sources of fertilizer. The ease of finding and using manure sources. It's very difficult for a farmer to pick up the telephone uh, and make one call and have a certain amount of manure delivered to his farm like he can with uh, inorganic nutrient sources. And finally, public perception and odor concerns are, are a limitation in some areas. Pathogens is another issue that we need to address with water, primarily a drinking water concern, but also can impact food quality and safety. Uh, land application and, and storage are great ways of dealing with pathogens. The, the research is fairly conclusive that, that, that pathogens are, are significantly reduced 
when the manure is land applied. And I'd refer you to the, the pathogen white paper. There, there's two of those that were also done at the same time as this one, as well as our previous webcast on, on pathogens. And some of the hormones and, and, and the other issues that we're going to be talking about under the emerging issues uh, area at the Livestock and Poultry Learning Center, they're receiving more, and more attention and, and there's not as much known about them. I think one of the things when we get to this public uh, perception issue is the importance of distinguishing between point and non-point sources of pollution. And, and I'm sure we are all aware of situations where animal feeding uh, operations have had uh, negative impacts on the environment. Uh, but usually when you hear about them, it, it's often because of point sources as opposed to uh, non-point sources uh, of pollution. R rarely do you find land, uh, animal manures being land applied at appropriate rates uh, that, that lead to a lot of environmental problems. With water quality and land application, we need to also be aware that the manure nutrients are often less soluble and less less prone to losses than, than or inorganic sources. There is a perception out there that, that commercial fertilizer may be better because you're less likely to have problems. Well, on a pound-for-pound -pound basis, if you put the same amount of nutrients out there, the nutrients in that manure are going to be less soluble, and in all likelihood you would have less losses than you would with a uh, inorganic source of nutrients. And, and that's primarily because the microbes have to work to break them down to make them uh, available. We also need to realize the be be best way to protect water quality is to control the amount, timing, and location of manure application. And this is going to be accomplished through nutrient management planning. Uh, with either manure or with inorganic sources, natural systems leak and, and losses are going to be Will, will occur, uh, whether or not it's manure or commercial fertilizer, and we need to use BMPs to minimize these risks. So when it comes to a farmer looking at fertility sources, organic sources, he knows they can improve soil quality, they, he can uh, improve water quality potentially, but, but he has uncertainty about the nutrient content and the availability is often limited. Uh, Inorganic sources are cheaper to store, cheaper to transport. You know exactly what you got, you, you, you're getting, but but you also need to be aware that it takes a lot of energy to produce these inorganic sources of, of nutrients. Uh, so it's important to recognize the value that manure plays. We need to to look more at uh, the economic value of these non-fertility impacts. We need to recognize that, that reductions in, and runoff and soil erosion have a value uh, associated with them. Off-farm uh, use to control non-point source pollution, you know, that's a, it's an emerging area, but we're seeing it all over the country where compost is being used in soil, uh, in stormwater management and improving soil quality, and I think this is going to grow. And in the future, I think a lot of our educational efforts need to focus on the, the sustainability impacts of, of using manure. Uh, you know, mining, mining phosphorus uh, is not going to get it, going to provide the long-term solutions, and, and we need to realize that, that manure offers a sustainable way of recycling uh, nutrients. So in summary, and this is my, my, my last slide, this is part of a national educated, a slide that's in the national uh, education program we, we developed where we simply ask, is manure good or bad? You know, it can be a source of pathogens and oxygen demanding substances that hurt water quality or a source of plant nutrients that can save you energy and money. Uh, it can be the largest source of water quality impairment or it can be a, a source of organic matter that improves soil quality. It can be a source of owner, of odor and emissions that cause neighbor conflicts, or it can be a means of sequestering carbon and, and helping solve global warming issues. And basically, it all comes down to how we manage manure that determines which it is. 
we've got to use proper nutrient management uh, and, and manage it in an appropriate manner to make sure that manure is a resource that has lots of value on farm operations. With that, I guess we're going to save questions till the end. Uh,